All right, thank you, Neil, and thank you uh, to Bob and Eileen at City and uh, to Gifford uh, and everybody that's a part of this today. Uh, while everybody's getting mic'd up, um, uh, I'm Jonathan Bowles, and I run the Center for an Urban Future. And, um, and just, uh, you know, we're, we're so excited to get this uh, report out today, and, and I just want to kind of echo some things that have been mentioned that, um, you know, we're at a time that as much as New York City has done, and, you know, the Bloomberg <coughs> administration has really been uh, at the forefront of so much policy innovation, you know, New York still faces a number of, um, of really big challenges ahead. And I think that the point of our report is that, you know, the next mayor in New York doesn't have to start from scratch, but that, that cities today have been the, the real drivers of policy innovation, and that there's a lot of great models out there from Seattle to Chicago to Denver to London that, that the next mayor should really look to. And, um, and so we're, uh, so that's really what this report is about. And I'm gonna take a, a second here to just introduce everybody. Um, so we're really uh, thrilled to have Linda Gibbs here today. Linda is, is uh, standing on, on the far end. You probably all already know Linda. Uh, she's New York City's Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services. No, 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 no. We gotta have to get, we gotta brighten it up. And, um, and I guess, <laughs> In an administration that clearly is known for policy innovation, um, Linda is really at the forefront of those efforts. And we've been fortunate to get to know some of the great things that, that she's been working on and all of her team. Um, I'll just mention a couple of things. HHS Accelerator, Access NYC, the Center for Economic Opportunity, the Office of Financial Empowerment. I could really go on and on, but, um, but there's been so much that, that, that has been happening and sh that she's <coughs> responsible for in the Bloomberg administration. Uh, Mayor Angel Taveras, um, you know, uh, thank you so much for being here, for coming down to New York City. Uh, uh, Mayor Taveras is really at the cutting edge of innovation uh, and has been since taking office in 2011. Uh, most recently, uh, you probably saw him in the news uh, a lot uh, because earlier this year, uh, he was really the uh, spearhead behind uh, Providence winning the $5 million uh, uh, Mayor's <laughs> Challenge, uh, a, a really an amazing uh, <laughs> for an early childhood literacy program that he and his team in Providence put together that the Bloomberg Philanthropies um, um, awarded uh, the first prize for their kind of city's innovation challenge. Uh, ben Hecht um, is uh, really an amazing person on top of all sorts of policy innovation going on, not just in New York, but all sorts of cities across the country. He's president and CEO of Living Cities, which harnesses the collective knowledge of 22 member foundations and corporations, uh, financial institutions, to help low-income people in the cities where they live. Uh, I should also add, and not to embarrass him, but I saw recently that Atlantic, City co Atlantic Cities called him the public-private whisperer. <laughs> <laughs> um, whatever that means. My new tagline. <laughs> I don't know what it means, but it sounds good, doesn't it? A reality show coming soon. Um, and, uh, Vishan Chakrabarty, um, who's a really good friend of the organization and uh, is one of the most innovative thinkers in New York City. Um, he's a partner at Shop Architects. He's the former head of the Manhattan office of the Department of City Planning. And uh, I think one of the things that I'm really excited to hear more about today is that he's the author of a book that's really coming out right about now called A Country of Cities, uh, which is uh, billed as a manifesto for urban America. So um, I'm gonna take a seat, maybe I can get mic'd up in a second, but before I, I do, let me kick it out to all of you on the panel. Um, you know, in this process, as we did this report, we really saw just so many good ideas from cities around the country. It really does seem like cities have become the laboratories for, for innovation and experimentation. And, and I'm, I wanted to just put out there, wh wh why is this? Why is it that you're seeing, it seems like much more than 10 years ago, 15 yeah. years ago, why, why have cities kind of picked up the mantle of innovation? And Linda, maybe you, we could just go down the, the list. Sure, um, I th well I think probably the biggest uh, reason is that we're on the front lines and it's where the issues are and it's where the opportunities are. And so um, as you look at the range of issues that the city faces, and I, I think with the leadership of um, folks like Mayor Bloomberg, where he challenged his commissioners to, um, to go into their agencies, to figure out what was working, support that, but more importantly, understand what's not working and fix it. I mean, that's what he really gave us, was the challenge to reform, and with that kind of mandate, um, and, and sort of just, you know, sort of leading into the issue rather than being defensive, being willing to honestly assess the situation, and, um, and take risks and be creative 
with the potential that you can make the services that your city provides better. I mean, that's really um, sort of the closeness to the issues um, makes it possible. Mayor? Well, I, <coughs> I do think that cities are where um, things are happening. Uh, partly, it's, um, if you think about Washington and how dysfunctional it's become to a large degree, um, cities have had to really take the lead. Um, and the, when you think about it, for example, I just <laughs> used Washington as an example. When was the last time we passed a budget in Washington? Um, you have to have a, a budget in the city. You need to meet it and stay within it as much as you can. Uh, but the other thing about cities, and I've learned this as being mayor the last two and a half years, uh, you see your constituents every single day. Mm -hmm. And um, they are not shy, um, certainly uh, not in Providence. I doubt that in New York either. Um, and they will let you know what's going on and what is impacting their lives. And it can be as something as simple as um, <coughs> uh, an issue with a trash can to a pothole um, to schools. Um, to crime, to whatever might be going on in the city, and you have to really show results and get things done. Um, and that's something that uh, I've learned in the last two and a half years. I'm curious, and I, and I want to get to Ben and Deshaun in a second, but, but for the two of you in particular that are inside government, clearly, um, I mean, how much of it is, is also due to the fact that, um, you know, there's less money coming from Washington? Mm -hmm. uh, the problems haven't gone away, uh, clearly, but it seems like maybe more is on cities to solve the problems. Is that right? W without, without a doubt. I mean, uh, it's difficult. It's not just less money coming from um, Washington. In our case, and I'm sure in other cities uh, across the country, uh, aid has been cut from, uh, from the state as well. So that's been a challenge in the past. And uh, yeah, you do have to do uh, a lot more with, uh, with less. And uh, in difficult ec economic times, the needs in the city, uh, uh, you have more needs in the city. So um, that's a challenge as well. I think the other thing that has impacted us is technology. Um, the ability to communicate on a broad level in a very simple way. I mean, I tweeted a little bit earlier about being here today, uh, but think about that five years ago. Um, you know, uh, heck, five years ago, uh, the iPad uh, wasn't. Uh, Kind of exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, I think technology has changed the way that we do things as well, and the ability for people to relay information on a very broad scale very easily uh, has changed. And I think a, a great example um, in response to your question is our social impact <coughs> bond initiative in New York City, where um, faced with the fact that agencies were cutting budgets, it made it more difficult to engage them in a discussion about new initiatives to reduce the social disparities for black and Latino boys in New York City. But when we put the social impact bond possibility on the table, it almost gave permission again to start mm -hmm. to think about trying new things. And, um, and this, um, this mechanism, which brings private capital in to solve social problems, is um, first launched here in New York City on a model created in the UK, again, learning from our partners and being willing to sort of listen to what other people are doing outside the, <coughs> the five boroughs of the city, but, um, but sort of bringing together those public-private partnerships in a new way in the face of that economic reality to energize the conversation, sort of, you know, allowed us to tap into our innovative um, um, inclinations. Right. Ben? Uh, I think that you just touched on two of the three I was going to say. But I just, uh, it, it, one was necessity. You know, is it, is it is the quote necessity is the mother of invention? If it's not, it's a good quote. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that really is the is the reality. Um, the other is technology. I mean, it has impacted so many elements of the way and what government can do. But I think the third one, I, the mayor is such a great example <laughs> of that. There it has been a, a generational and sort of substantive change in the in the face of of, uh, of the faces of mayors across the country. Um, and by that, I mean you have a, a generational thing, young, um, who are not burdened by the sort of legacy assumptions that you know, some of the older generation uh, mayors had. But I think the other part of it is, is many of them come from the private sector. And it's not, a, it's not an empty thing, well, I was in the private sector. No, these people ran stuff. And it's not just Bloomberg. You know, I think of uh, the mayor of Louisville. Um, who he, his family invented uh, the ice that dispenses from the, uh, the things when you go into 7-Eleven and you push the machine, you know, they invented that. <laughs> and uh, 
I don't know, but yeah, I don't know about the 32 ounce, 64 ounce thing. I'll leave that to you. But but the ice, calorie free. Okay, that's okay. Um, but the what what what's interesting is they when they were in the bus in business, they used everything that was available to them. You know, they said we're going to you know steal what we need to steal, you know, idea wise and make it better and you know and compete. And so I think you you have a much uh, you you not invented here is much less a reality when you look at cities around the country than it used to be. Yeah. If I could add one thing, um, and thank you for calling me young. I, <laughs> I like to tell everyone I'm young. I have a 42-year-old back. But, uh, <laughs> but the one thing that's interesting is uh, when I first became mayor, I had a meeting of all of my directors, and I told them essentially that the right answer, I don't think the right answer is ever, that's the way we've always done it. Um, and that uh, I really wanted them to think outside the box and think about how we could solve things <coughs> and not be tied to the way that we've always done it. Because um, if you do that, there's not much change. So I do think that that has been a big, uh, a big issue uh, in many ways. You've got to start getting people to, to think differently, to look at, at problems differently, to try different solutions, and to not be afraid um, to take a, a risk. Uh, uh, and uh, that's certainly something we've tried to do in Providence. Great. Michelle? Well, so I'd, I'd agree that, you know, at the governance level, what we're clearly seeing are sort of smart, non-ideological approaches to solutions because you have to be that way. You have to balance the budget, as the mayor said, and all of that. Um, and by non-ideological, I don't think that means that it's without values, mm -hmm. but it's not necessarily the fights of the 1960s that were, after all, a half century ago. Um, and. Um, I think the other thing that's very interesting is if you look at the data nationwide, uh, that the, basically cities are growing faster than the suburbs for the, for the first time since right. the 1920s. Uh, and uh, it's extraordinary. Cities, you know, basically 90% of the GDP of the United States, 86% of US jobs are generated on 3% of the land mass of the United States. Mm -hmm. That's cities. Right. The carbon footprint of the average city dweller is far lower. Um, ability for, you know, in terms of, we're not doing this perfectly, but social mobility in mm -hmm. cities is much better than in suburban locations. So there's a variety of things that I think are attracting young talent that are then creating the innovations that you're talking about into cities. But I think that presents a new host of challenges uh, for, you know, the century we're heading into. I want to add one, one thing to that. We're looking at kind of recent data just this week, I think it was yesterday. Um, census put out that for the first time in a hundred some years, we had more uh, babies, uh, I mean, uh, more uh, white people die than born. And, you know, it's just sort of the, 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 the constant drumbeat of the reality that we are fast becoming a, a, a majority minority nation. And, and I think I I in a very good way, it's being led by people who are uh, going to be that majority very soon. And, but it also requires us to attack the problems of the systems that we built 100 years ago that aren't actually preparing our next majority to compete in the global economy. And that is such a critical issue that, you, that is going to take 10, 15, 20 years to start to really make a, a difference on. And I think many of the, the leaders see that and they're like, these are intractable problems that we can no longer ignore. Ben and also Vishan, um, I'm curious because uh, Linda mentioned earlier how actually there have been these things in New York where you have looked at other cities and they've been they have been models for the Bloomberg administration. It's actually a little bit of a departure because I mean in in our experience <laughs> in New York, uh, you know New Yorkers are pretty arrogant. You know uh, we 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 like to be kind of a net exporter of ideas, and I, I think that's probably the case. But um, but clearly, um, bike bike share city bike is an example that uh, it's not an idea that started here, uh, but that's it's happening more and more. But what what are some ideas that maybe New Yorkers aren't aware of um, that you know in your work in, in a lot of different cities, Ben and, and Vishan, and, and the book that you you you're putting together? Uh, is there an example that you'd like to kind of share that where you think a city is just you know really innovating or experimenting as a way to solve a big problem? Uh, there's 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 a bunch of them. Uh, let me just try to highlight a couple things, and some of it is a way of working. Um, so one of the things, uh, we have a, a large scale initiative that we call the Integration Initiative. It's uh, integrating people, place, and opportunity, integrating leadership from the public, private, philanthropic sector, integrating different types of capital. And we're in five uh, large cities around the country uh, doing this. And, and essentially what we're seeing is the leader, first of all, it's the public sector realizing the limitation of their ability with a expiration date stamped on their heads. 
to actually make the change, you know, really uh, be the ones who lead, who make the change within their terms. You know, so you have a very limited number of, of mayors. Some had to get a third term, you know, some like Menino or, or, or Rich Daly, you know, they have these extended periods. It's not the norm. And, and so what we're seeing is an ability to collaborate, um, to actually focus on results. I mean, that's what the power of the, the social innovation bonds is it's actually not about the input. It's about we don't care how you do it, just get us the result. And so I think we see these new forms of, of collaboration um, that are happening all over the, over the country. And I think the other is, is uh, there are many places that are aggressively figuring out how do we marry different types of capital um, that we, are, we only have so much bond, municipal bonds that we can issue on our own. Um, and so one of them, so I'll give an example of uh, Oklahoma City, uh, you know, not a bastion of progressive liberalism. Uh, and you know, they have, I think, six times now taxed themselves mm -hmm. um, for things that they know they need, right? And, and so, and the mayors, it's now been three mayors who've, who've done that, uh, all Republican. You know, and so I think having the guts to actually say, you know what, all our schools are dilapidated, and if we actually want people to come and stay here, we gotta fix them, they tax themselves to do it. You know, we have highways, we wanna rip down and build green space and parks, let's tax ourselves to do it. Um, so those, those kind of things. Sean, any, any thoughts for a friend of mine? Um, well, I would agree, on the physical front, certainly, um, you, uh, there's a massive public-private partnership in San Francisco going on to build Trans Bay Terminal that I think will ultimately put what's happening at sort of Penn Station and other places where we have really a severe crisis going on in the spotlight. Uh, Dallas is doing incredible things in terms of uh, philanthropy and building uh, culture and parks in, in the middle of downtown Dallas. Chicago has completely changed their physical landscape. Uh, and so, so it is interesting. And we've been doing many of those things as well. It's not that we haven't, but um, I think uh, other cities around the country are actually a bit ahead of us in terms of figuring out infrastructure, mm -hmm. ballot referenda to pay for infrastructure and so forth, where we're really riding the coattails of what our predecessors did 100 years ago still in terms of infrastructure, I think. Good point. Linda, um, so you mentioned, a, a, I mentioned a few things that, that have been really innovative that the Bloomberg administration has done. You mentioned a couple others. And um, so it's, it's easy, right? I mean, uh, innovating <laughs> is a piece of cake. Um, no, really, what, what, um, what, what do you have to put in place? What, 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 what allows this? Because I think people do look to the Bloomberg administration. And I should say that when you know, Neil and I and all our team did, did research around the country, I can't tell you how many times people told us well, the Bloomberg administration is, are, you know, they're innovating. We asked people in Chicago and San Francisco what are their good ideas, and they said, well, New York's doing a lot of good ideas. Um, but how do, you, how do you do that? How do you create mm -hmm. the conditions mm -hmm. um, I in your administration and uh, for your staff to actually come up with those ideas and mm -hmm. things that are workable? So it, I've mentioned the leadership, which I think is really critical. Um, we've talked here about the openness to learn from others, and that means that you have to have communication and sort of be willing to look at other people and see what they're doing and, and recognize that there's plenty that others have to offer. And then when you do it, you don't have, you know, you can just say this is New York City brand, you know, you don't have to always like, you know, um, advertise the fact that you're just copycatting. Um, but I think the thing that I would emphasize now is the importance of a, um, a delivery structure that can help you to know what the issues are and then to track account implementation and accountability. Um, the um, when we created our Center for Economic Opportunity, when, after the mayor asked us to look at new ways to tackle poverty in the city, we put together a group that essentially was focused on being an ongoing research and development capacity in um, the anti-poverty area, where an emphasis was on gathering the baseline data, having a team of people that could work with the agencies to bring their ideas through to fruition, and then to collect data and do evaluation to make sure it was successful. And in a way, it's like it's, um, when um, um, Speaker um, Miller earlier said that for the, you know, the mayor <coughs> and the top staff, that there's such a barrage of stuff coming at you, you don't always have the time to sit and pause and think. And by creating uh, this research and development capacity in our CEO, which um, actually Bloomberg Philanthropies has been creating innovation teams in mayor's offices across the, the country with this very purpose in mind. Have somebody who is tasked with take, taking a step back, be out, being outside the you know, direct firing line, 
and look at in, um, with data and um, a set of metrics that are focused on what your outcomes are um, that you're trying to achieve um, to be that constant source of checking in to see how you're doing, but also to be asking the questions about, well, all right, that's not working, how can you do it differently? And I think that is really important to introduce um, a mechanism in the, the administration that you have um, developed like a capacity mm -hmm. for a culture of innovation. What do you think about that? Um, how, do, how do you create the kind of conditions for innovation, uh, Mayor Tavares? And, and also, what do you think about what, what Linda was talking about, the idea of kind of data and, and accountability to make sure the actual new policy is getting results? Well, I think Linda is absolutely right about the culture of innovation. I think that's extremely important to have, and it starts at the top, and that's why I've tried to do that with all the directors. In Providence, I mean, we're smaller. We're 178,000 people. Um, so. Uh, one of the things that I've tried to do is to use the talent that we have. We had issues uh, in terms of transparency and open government, so we put together a task force of some of the best bright minds in our city, and I said, help me uh, address this. And they have, they came, they did a report, and we are implementing the report, and they're keeping track of it, and so am I, and we're making sure we get that done. Um, and as I think people see that government is listening to their ideas and is open to change and open to innovation, you see more of it and people um, able to communicate those ideas to you. Um, I think that you can't, you know, you can't um, evaluate what you can't measure. So you have to have uh, tools to measure and you have to have data and know how to use it. And that's something else that we're doing um, in, the, uh, in the city where I've worked with all of our department heads to set goals and I said, uh, these are the goals that we have and this is how we're going to measure them. And with, uh, obviously, uh, collaboratively, I said, you know, we, we went through a process so that uh, they could let us know what they thought the right measurements were. But absolutely, you have to be able to measure and use data, and the data should be available to people, and we're working on doing that right now as well in Providence. And I think uh, one other thing, and that is that in terms of the cities, um, I look to see what's going on around the country, um, and a lot of the ideas, I mean, it's true, New York has, is doing such amazing things, and it's such a much bigger scale than uh, Rhode Island. I mean, Rhode Island has one million people total, okay, so... Um, I've got that many people in my building. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe it. And so, so it's a very different, uh, it's a very different uh, model in, or a scale, certainly, in, in Rhode Island. But we look to see what other people are doing. Uh, and already today, as I look to see what San Francisco is doing with the savings for college, um, I've already thought of something that we can do in Providence similar. Um, I have a book that I've written on how to do well in school that I give to all kindergartners in the city of Providence, about 2,000 kindergartners. I'm going to figure out now a way to get some of the banks and some other folks to try to do what San Francisco has done so we can not only do the book, but we can also do the savings bond. Um, and that's just coming here, listening, and seeing what's going on and saying, how can we apply that in Providence? Um, so uh, we, uh, you know, I, I'm afraid to say this, because I think we're being filmed to say, uh, <laughs> good, good mayor steal, but yeah. ideas, yeah. ideas. Yeah. So, um, can't and steal implementation. That's right. You gotta yeah, do that's that right. That, right. You yeah. gotta, but and the I want to say, if I'm, I'm going to interrupt, because um, um, Mayor Tavares, of course, won the, the, um, the $5 million prize for um, innovation in municipal government. Um, the um, Janice Nicoli and, and Ben and I, and I don't know if anybody else in the room were, was on, were on the selection committee, where there were hundreds of ideas, and then the 50 best got brought to the selection committee, and it was really tough to winnow it down and winnow it down and winnow it down until you, the, you know, the number one rose to the top. And I think that really is a testament to the point that you're making, which is that there's, you know, cities really do remarkable innovation. But I think the, um, to, to share with you, Mayor, when our mayor was briefed on what the, the, your winning prize was, it, it was to, he, said, he said, why didn't I think of that? <laughs> why didn't I, I was like, he was like, yeah, oh my God, that's so great. Why didn't I think of that? And, and there's, there's answers, there's issues all over the place, mm -hmm. of course, but there were so many answers, and sometimes there are some that just, when, they, when, you, when you hit on it, it was like, oh my God, that was there all the time. Why didn't we think of that? And, it's, and that's why I think it's really important to be open to, you know, that, what is that, is the way you put it, that, you know, the way that we've done it is not the answer for right. how right. you should do it in the future, and just to know that there are constant ways that you can improve the outcomes for it, as you do see. But if I can add one thing on that, and that is that, I mean, we're fortunate, and I said this when we won uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, that we have someone like 
Mayor Bloomberg and Bloomberg Philanthropies that's really encouraging and being a catalyst for the change in innovation. Um, I saw when he announced, or Bloomberg Philanthropies first announced this competition, and I said, well, I want to be part of that. And part of that, by the way, is just uh, following things on Twitter and other things, and you, you read and you see that what's going on. Uh, but to have that opportunity to try an idea that you think will work, but you don't have the funds to do it otherwise, to be given that opportunity is a wonderful blessing. So we're very, very fortunate as mayor to have someone like Mayor Bloomberg uh, that really wants to encourage innovation. And it's not just from the, the mayor's challenge. He's doing this with uh, cities of service. He's doing it with all sorts of different things. So uh, we're very fortunate in that sense. I want to I want to follow up with uh, with actually a, an analogy to, to the tech sector. New York mm -hmm. City has, has really seen a, a growing tech sector recently, and and you know New York has a ton of startups. Mm -hmm. I think the question for New York going forward for a lot of cities is how many of these startups can get to the next level. Mm -hmm. And with innovations, I have a similar question. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of these cities, including New York, are putting these great ideas in practice, many in the pilot stage. Mm -hmm. How do how do cities make sure? And, and Ben, maybe you could start yeah, with sure. this. How do you make sure that they scale up and that they don't just stay at these small pilot ideas? Yeah, so so we have one, uh, we've made one investment in that, which is a network of chiefs of staff, the mayor's chiefs of staff is active in this, um, that we bring together twice a year at the Kennedy School at Harvard. We call it the Project on Municipal Innovation. And the idea really is, is that you have these chiefs of staff who really are the ones that, uh, as we understand it, the, uh, and their deputies, who is here today, um, are the ones who actually the mayor counts on to implement the stuff. And, uh, and so it's this robust platform where they basically can share ideas and help each other and kind of co-create and adopt the innovations kind of simultaneously in a bunch of places. Interestingly, we've had in these six years we've been doing this, changes of administrations in a number of these 35 cities and it, their participation continues. So the idea of institutionalizing within the government and uh, the folks who are going to be active in it, regardless of the mayors. I mean, one of the most powerful things I heard, Linda, when Mayor Koch died when we were together, uh, I think it was actually in Harvard, this idea is that people who are committed to this work, like Linda Gibbs, they're in it over multiple administrations. And they're learning and growing from the mistakes and the things that, that they've learned. We created this platform in which, in which to do it. Um, and we've already, it, and it's very worthwhile. Our board just re-upped for another three years of doing it because we're seeing the uptake. The challenge with it is, is some of the bigger cities, like New York, less active in it. So they're, you know, and, and New York, Chicago, they've been harder to, to, to keep at the table. In part, I think, well, they're busy, but I think the other part is I think, you know, there is a thing where we're, we're sort of leaders, what is there to learn? And, and I do think that is, you know, that's one of the, the, the challenges uh, that we have there. But I do think um, that the idea of really embedding this new culture in the way the government works is going to be the thing that makes a difference. These innovation teams that Bloomberg Philanthropy has supported in a handful of cities, um, but also the, the academies where you're training the next generation of, of professionals. But, but the other thing that we're seeing a lot of is you really have to make some structural changes in the way the government operates so it's not really reliant on the person. You know, the, the charismatic mayor, the amazing Linda Gibbs, that kind of thing. But in fact, you, so one of the things that we have a lot of, we think holds a lot of promise that we're investing in as well is helping cities to open up their uh, data, um, not just for transparency and accountability, but what you see you can use that data for, you know, new products with apps, um, uh, data analytics that actually force the, the government to be smarter. You know, so if you can make these structural changes, um, that are clearly just a better way to govern. It's not going to be relying on the, uh, the, the election cycle. Um, go ahead. Well, I just, uh, just in terms of the physical nature of what you were asking about in terms of the tech sector and startups and how to get them uh, more established, what I think is astonishing is if you look back and you think about the beginning of the Bloomberg administration, you know, just 12 years ago, this city was still largely a hub-and-spoke city. It was a traditional hub-and-spoke city where people mainly commuted in and out of Midtown and, and, and downtown, of course, and when the mayor came in, you know, we, we were all dealing with 9-11. But you look at that same city today, and it's extraordinary how much this has changed. This is now a network of business hubs, right, from the Flatiron District to Hudson Square. In fact, this area that we're in right now has some of the, it, it, it's about the softest office market in the city relative to all sorts of other parts of town. There is an incredibly tech, incredible tech community in Dumbo. 
Uh, we're designing an incredible uh, new kind of hub in Domino. And I think that, and, and if you talk to the Walentises about Dumbo, what you find out is, in terms of your question about scaling up, um, you know, you had companies that were 5,000 square feet, and there were six of them on a floor, and now one of the companies has grown, and it wants to be 30,000 square feet, and what decision do you make? Do you allow that company to be 30,000 square feet on that floor and kick out the other, uh, the, the other small companies? And the real issue there is that should not be th that should not be the the choice. Right. The choice should really be well, where else can these companies grow? And you know, our, our zoning code, every uh, the entire way in which we've thought about the city, and I think most cities, is still built around this hub and spoke mm -hmm. idea. Whereas I think the future, especially with technology, is not is is a networked idea mm -hmm. within a big city, where there are lots and lots of places where people live, work, and play. Uh, and we have to start building an infrastructure around that, both a technological infrastructure as well as a physical infrastructure, and that's a big challenge, I think, uh, in the years ahead. Um, again, uh, following up on that, and, and I think uh, I'm curious, particularly for what's going on in Providence and, and, and New York City, um, just, um, you know, it seems like when we were talking before about with less money coming from the federal government, it's really up to the cities to, to innovate these days, and you're doing that. But how, how do you take them from kind of this idea, this, you know, something that may be working on a small scale and getting that up to the next level? Is that where you actually require more funding coming in from the federal government? And, and how do you scale them up without that? I mean, we're not expecting huge sums of, of funding to be coming in. So if you do see things that are working in your administration now, or if this you know, program that you're putting in place that you won the mayor's challenge for, you know, how do you, how do you begin to scale those up? Well, in Providence, I mean, I think, again, uh, Providence is a little bit, well, it's a big difference from New York, uh, given the population. Um, I think that we rely a lot more on philanthropy and assistance from uh, outside of government to help us. And uh, one of the things that I hope was attractive to Bloomberg Philanthropies is the fact that um, five million dollars in Rhode Island goes a long, long way, and uh, we're, we plan on trying to use that uh, to really have this program go uh, citywide. Um, so um, I think that you, in, at least in, in our situation, uh, again different from New York, we will continue to focus on private philanthropy and local philanthropy as well. I think when you have data that can show that things are working, and, and, and that's something that's very important, our program for those of you who don't know what we're doing, what we will be doing in Providence with the Bloomberg Philanthropy uh, Prize is working on closing the uh, word gap that exists between uh, less affluent and more affluent kids. And that exists already by the time they start kindergarten. And we're going to be uh, using a device, a small little device, to record the number of words that kids hear, working with parents um, and child care providers to help them um, with strategies on how to expand the child's vocabulary. And uh, we'll be measuring the success of that. Brown University will be measuring the success of that. Um, and uh, we, we hope to have the data to show that the kids are entering school uh, a lot m uh, better prepared um, after, uh, after using our program. But um, the data is so helpful. When you can show people <coughs> that, um, look, this is what was going on before. This is what's going on now. This is the difference that it's making. Uh, an investment in our project uh, is a good investment, and you're going to see good returns. And especially with early childhood education, when we know that um, the returns are long term and uh, huge benefits. Um, so I think you use data, you try to leverage uh, funds as much as you can, um, and hope that we can improve our economy and, uh, and also eventually get more help from the government. And so to build on that, I would say that um, we have to use the data that comes out of these experiments to, um, to, to prove what works, to help bring those lessons into the mainstream programs. And so if you can take a $5 million initiative in Providence and show that there are techniques that you can use at home with parents that are simple and low cost, that they can spread, then you can, um, you can do that simply by spreading that knowledge without having to infuse the system with new dollars. We spend a lot of money in this country on early child care and education. You can transform the way those services are delivered. You can take the program as you have it 
and change it entirely and just tell folks, you know, this is how we want you to do it instead and this is the what's proven. So here's the evidence of what works. This is the model we're adopting. And you can say for th those things that don't work, we're not gonna spend that money anymore and we're right. gonna move that into things that do work. Okay, let me touch on, because I think that's the most important point in, in all of this innovation. It's that I think for 50, 60 years, we funded innovation that always sat on the periphery. It's like, oh, that's great. We've trained 25 new phlebotomists when there's three million people that need you know, a job at a living <laughs> wage. It's ridiculous. And the reali reality was, while you're training those 24 and spending a million dollars to train it, you've got three billion dollars that you're spending in a workforce system not getting the results you want, but you're afraid to take that system on because of all of its implications, which are challenging. But that's where the money is. And, the, and, and, Nan and, and uh, Linda's point is the key point. It's like you need the leaders like the mayor and Linda who are saying we are actually going to stop spending the money that's not getting the results we want and we're going to spend it on the stuff that we think is either proven or really much more promising that, than what we're currently doing. It takes a huge amount of guts. Um, but it also, that's why we've seen some real success where you actually have leaders from different sectors who, who, who have, you know, control parts of the money that flows into these things. Um, you know, that can cover the political leaders or whoever needs political cover and said, you know what, we may not see the result in two years, we may not even see it in four years, but in six years we will. And that's not something that only the, uh, the electeds can, can deliver on. But, but, but the idea of in Cincinnati where they sort of inspired a nationwide effort called the Strive Network on cradle to career, and we've been a, a big supporter of that expanding na nationally, they basically said, the first thing they said is, we are program rich and systems poor which meant everybody wants their own program. Ah, uh, you know, I'm X foundation, I love high school graduation. You know, I'm the so-and-so, I love uh, reading by third grade. But the bottom line is, if you're not doing the whole continuum, you're not getting the result. So they said, we're not accepting any new money for programs, we've got those. We actually have to realign them so we actually have a system that gets consistent results without new grant money. So I think we should, I, I think you can't avoid the politics of that conversation because if it, so if you look at the 2012 presidential electoral map by county, what you realize is cities are, are bastions of progressive politics. Mm -hmm. Even in the deep red states, right? Uh, most cities in red states are still pretty blue. And as cities grow and we talk about these issues, we're I think going to have to wrestle with our own demons in terms mm -hmm. of those progressive politics because what we find is. <coughs> Shockingly, there are contradictions within <laughs> progressive politics. And so, you know, what this means is that we end up competing for public goods, especially in a very resource constrained mm -hmm. system. So, for instance, I you know, if a city is focused on quality of life issues to attract new talent, that can come head to head with municipal pension costs and mm -hmm. other budgetary mm -hmm. issues that constrain most city budgets. And I, th those are usually sort of left on left issues that we don't really want to confront very much in big cities. Uh, it take the physical environment where, you know, higher density housing is the best way to deliver affordable housing, and yet a lot of community groups don't want high density housing in their neighborhoods. That is, you know, those are the kinds of political issues mm -hmm. that I think if we don't get past, we're not going to solve a lot of these problems. And I would just close that out by saying that, you know, in this city, certainly, the next mayor is going to face a very difficult budget, right? We all know that. And uh, th there is not going to be money not raining down from Washington, even though we send much more money to Washington mm -hmm. than we get back. Mm -hmm. And so, to, you know, you look around, what are the limited solutions for that? Probably the biggest solution is growth, because an additional person actually brings more money into the municipal coffers than they take out. Uh, how that growth happens, where that growth mm -hmm. occurs, how you guide it, and how you get through the politics of it, I think is a tremendous challenge, but to me, at least it seems like the only answer in terms of growing the pie uh, and not just making the pie more efficient mm -hmm. because we're not going to solve all of our problems by doing that. Let me take something you said and, and also something you said earlier uh, about infrastructure and, and I'm curious, uh, let's have a, a quick talk about New York City and, and there's been a lot of innovations in the last ten, 10 or 12 years, but what's left? for New York City. What are some of the next big areas that <laughs> of, of innovation? Uh, Jeannie, Jeannie, do you want to answer this question? <laughs> you, want to, you want to talk about Penn Station? <laughs> um, you know, and, and can, we, can we 
<laughs> can, we like get, her? can we get space time to uh, <laughs> can we get space time to crowdsource Penn Station? Actually, <laughs> 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 twenty five dollars <laughs> at a time. <laughs> No, seriously, I mean, I think you put out infrastructure, obviously Penn Station I is connected to that, but like, you know, but clearly New York's facing some big problems, mm -hmm. and, and I mentioned this to Ben before we started the panel, you know, I mean, as much as this city has innovated and improved greatly mm -hmm. in recent years, there's some really big challenges awaiting New York, and I'm curious, you know, from all your perspectives, you know, what, what still has to happen, and, and are there kind of some innovations, maybe it's how we do infrastructure mm -hmm. funding or something that, that, that has to come up, but I'm, any other thoughts on just, you know, what, what the next mayor should really be looking to, to innovate on? Uh, well, again, I would, I would focus on growth and figuring out how to tap into the value creation that comes from growth uh, to help uh, build infrastructure. So that's essentially what uh, is happening in Hudson Yards. It is, at some measure, what happened there on the High Line. Uh, it, I think it's a, a, it could be a silver bullet with a place like Penn Station. I mean, what we have is something that most cities would be envious of, which is we have a market with the wind at its back, right? In other words, people want to come here. We have growth, right? Uh, most cities would be very, very jealous to have the kind of growth numbers that we have in terms of demand. The question is how to accept that growth and harness it, tap into the value of it to help us pay for things that we need because they're really isn't another source to pay for what is very, very expensive infrastructure. We also have to start figuring out why this infrastructure is so expensive. Mm -hmm. And that, again, is this competing public goods thing about why it is that you know a subway station for the number seven line costs $500 million. How did we get to this point in our lives? I mean, again, you can look around, you can look at London, you can look at a lot of cities around the world that are not spending these kinds of dollars to build the kind of infrastructure that we need. And again, that is about unpacking, I think, some demons that we have in the system. Yeah, we just did a study about the public libraries in New York, and it was kind of shocking how much some individual branches, there's 206 branch libraries around the city, and just to, to renovate one of them cost you know several million dollars. Um, but um, what, what other things? I mean, I mean, infrastructure seems like a, a really uh, a no-brainer. What other things, particularly around social services? I mean, let's uh, let's, let's let's be candid. I mean, you know, poverty rates mm -hmm. are still, you know, incredibly high in New York. There's a lot of <laughs> lot of issues that, that need to be addressed. What what would you suggest? Uh, and and I just obviously we've made um, with all the progress we've made, there is a long way to go. And I have a lot of fears about those um, initiatives that are underway. Um, getting turned away from, not continuing, um, not being pushed further. And, and I think that there's an, a, a constant tension. If I have a frustration with uh, the um, work that we've done on our anti-poverty agenda, it's been that in some sense, we've set ourselves up to overcome forces that are national forces, sure. that are national <laughs> economic forces. And you know the issue of income inequality in this country and across the world is tremendous. And, and I feel sometimes as we're trying to close the gap between those who are having the hardest time to connect to the local economy, that we think that those gap closing efforts are gonna solve the fundamental income inequality challenges. And so I would say that the one great thing that could come out of further work is to continue to push to close those gaps, but at the same time, join with other cities and think about how to push on national policies that can help to, um, to reduce the, the income inequality that exists. And, and there's gotta be that reality. Cities, in the absence <coughs> of federal or state solutions, cities can't solve everything. And in some ways, all of this, you know, this eagerness around innovation and, and you know, we're the ones who are on the front line, we have to do it. We, we, ha we can't let the state and federal folks off the hook because it's simply not mm -hmm. possible <coughs> to close it at a, lo a local level. And so I would say that's part of it. The, um, and then on the other on the other extreme, just if you if you walk around, like I loved, um, you know, we have our micro unit initiative in um, in New York City where we are experimenting with new designs for smaller living quarters. The whole impetus for that discussion <coughs> came out of a, um, a a homeless and affordable housing conversation where we recognized that the way that affordable housing finances are set up that you basically can't help anybody less than sixty to seventy thousand dollar a year annual income and that's a such a far cry from both the median mm -hmm. salary in the city <laughs> and from the twenty percent of people who are living be below the poverty line which means they're making less than twenty thousand right. dollars a year 
but housing finance dollars, those public dollars, can't get to them. And so we, that, the micro unit example was where we were trying to come up with a way <coughs> that you, the public subsidy can be less and therefore the income eligibility of who could afford that publicly subsidized unit can also drop down. The, um, the example of the, the, the conversion, the tertiary unit that the city was asked from Denver, was it, in your report? Um, there's a, but it, it's a, Seattle. So it's a, a companion piece where we have, we know that there are entire swaths of the city where there are um, overcrowded housing and there's a, there is a, a huge challenge of how do you um, ensure that they're safe, that, that people who are living in overcrowded conditions, I mean, if they ever were um, strictly enforced, there would be hundreds of thousands of people who would be out on the streets. And so, and we have to come up with solutions that solve that. And so thinking, rethinking a city's building and fire standards such that you can take the existing housing stock and accommodate um, in a safe and appropriate and humane manner more individuals. Dealing with the housing reality of the city is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, you know, I, I'm curious because you said you can't do it alone. And a lot of people, there's been a good focus recently on cities, uh, you know, and what they're doing to innovate. And we all recognize that the federal government is, you know, stuck in these partisan <laughs> battles and, and there's not a lot of funding coming. But very few people look at the state. You know, people are saying cities are, are, are the drivers of innovation. Uh, we're saying that. What, what's the role? Are states doing enough to help their cities? I'm curious, Ben, you're working with a lot of places. And yeah. Linda, maybe I'll, I won't put you on the spot with New York, but I'm curious, you know, what, what, should, what can states be doing to help yeah, their so cities? Yeah, it, so it's a mixed bag, as, as, you would, as you would guess. So we work a lot with governors and we work a lot, a lot with mayors. And mayors usually say, I don't know why the feds flow any money to the state. It should all come to the city. And the governors say, I don't know why any federal money goes directly to the city. It should only go to the state. Um, you know, state houses tend to look more uh, um, rural. You know, the legislatures tend to look more rural. Um, so it's, it's, it, it's hard. That said, there's some extraordinary stuff that is happening. You know, I think of Atlanta, um, where they have a remarkable mayor in Kasim Reed. Um, and the, the mayor, Democrat, governor, Republican, actually have done some incredible things together. They didn't get their... Uh, transportation bill passed, I mean, their transportation bond issue passed, but the fact that they were doing it together was extraordinary in, in most people's eyes. Um, there's, so there's a lot of good stories about it, um, but the states also, so I think there, you could look at some examples, but to be but realistically, the real money for the kind of things like infrastructure is not from the states either, to get to Linda's point. Uh, you know, I think yesterday in the paper it said, you know, for the first time since 08, 30 states are gonna ex uh, have a surplus. Um, since 08, you know, and that's before the impact of the sequester, you know, so I don't know that's not going to be the holy grail uh, I was at a, a conference in Brazil last week, which was a, a worldwide urbanization Conference and the thing that was one of the things that was so striking was the fact that every major Nation, you know, whether it's a brick or an, uh, someone who wants to be a country that wants to be a brick uh, nation They are spending billions and obsessed about the federal spend on infrastructure it's like that's the one thing they're talking about. No one's saying, wow, you know, uh, the, the, the new city in China should be only built with uh, revenue coming from the locals. You know, it's just the, it, any, any country that wants to be a economic, viable economic place to continue to have the people in poverty, you know, make the progress that they've been making, understand the investments they have to make as a nation. You know, and we uh, just, you know, we're clueless as, as to that, and uh, you know, I, I think that, that Linda's point is a really good one. You have to get the state to be a good partner, but I think there is something about the wake-up call that has to happen in Washington. <laughs> you know, I'm sure this is gonna be a very popular statement up on the second floor in Albany, but I think states are largely an anachronism. Um, you know, that, they, that, that, that you know, if you, if you think about a region like ours, uh, we have far more in common uh, with, you know, the city of Hoboken than we have with the city of Buffalo uh, in terms of, you know, what our future is as a region. And the problem, of course, is so you try to spend a dollar on, you know, on Penn Station and now you've got to spend a dollar on Schenectady. And this is, you know, really a problem when you're trying to figure out how to uh, better the busiest transportation hub in the North, in the, in, you know, in, in, the North Amer in North America, if not the Western <laughs> Hemisphere, right? And that we have to worry about Schenectady in the middle of this. Uh, and I, I just think that this is, and, and, you know, 
you're right, it's not necessarily where the biggest chunks of money are, but it's where the governance is. I mean, yeah. when you talk about infrastructure, there's a huge amount of, of state control of our infrastructure. And to me, this is highly problematic in terms of the mayor's ability to have home rule and actually figure out how to create the infrastructure that we need for a city like ours. And, um, you know, this is, if so, and again, if you look at Singapore or, or Hong Kong, mm -hmm. which by, by and large has home rule, mm -hmm. Right? They're able to take the tremendous tax dollars that they generate and reinvest them into the system, which is why they have fabulous subways and fabulous trains to the airport and fabulous everything else, because they're able to actually keep the money they generate, which is something that we're not able to do. Maybe Singapore has it right. They're the city and the state. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and I think um, uh, Rhode Island's a little bit different uh, because of our size again. And uh, we're essentially a city-state uh, providence uh, being the, the center of it. Um, and I will tell you that over the last two and a half years since I've been mayor, I've been very fortunate. I've had a General Assembly that has been extremely supportive uh, in terms of helping the city. And we wouldn't have made, we, we faced some very big budget issues and were concerned about Chapter 9 uh, because mm -hmm. we were running out of cash and uh, that was a real possibility. Uh, but the state has been uh, extremely supportive. Um, certainly uh, the Speaker of the House is, is from Providence, so that certainly mm -hmm. has been helpful. Uh, Senate President, while she's not from Providence, has been uh, very supportive of our city. So, I mean, I, I think I've, I've been fortunate in that sense to have that support um, from the state. I think that New York, as you point out, is a very different uh, situation. Um, and uh, so I don't know that we can compare the two <coughs> there. Um, but uh, states are, quite frankly, um, challenged right now as well because they're seeing, uh, I mean, it, it'll be great if they actually had surpluses this year, but. Uh, in our state, we've seen deficits, we've seen cuts from Washington, um, we've seen a lot of issues that have impacted us. Our unemployment rate has been uh, very high, one of the highest in the country. And so that all affects the, the revenues and our ability to invest in some of the things that we should be investing in. So they're feeling the pressures too and trying to find the best way to, to address it. Great. Well, I'm going to open the, uh, the up to questions from the audience, uh, but quickly, uh, Mayor, I'm just curious. <coughs> You're still a fairly new mayor, you know, uh, and um, New York City is going to have a brand new mayor uh, come January. Do you have any uh, uh, p point of advice for the next mayor in New York on, on how, to, how to innovate and experiment? Well, I think that uh, one thing I would say is that um, similar to what we did in Providence is to make sure people understand that because you've been doing something a certain way does not mean that that's the, the best way to do it, that you have to encourage people to uh, think outside the box. Um, the other thing I would say is this, when, we, when I took over in uh, Providence, uh, 60 days into my administration, I found out that we had a $110 million structural deficit on a budget of a, a little bit over $650 million. So just to give you an idea. Welcome. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Uh, it, was, it was too late for a recount, so um, <laughs> <laughs> I decided to, to see what we could do. But the one thing that we did was um, almost across the board, not, not totally, but uh, we had a goal of cutting about 10% uh, in our spending, um, in our labor contracts, and uh, different things that we were doing, 10%. Temp uh, and um, we also got help from our universities and our hospitals. We also got help from the General Assembly, um, also from the taxpayers. But just, I can only imagine New York's budget and if you're able to cut, I'm, I'm just going to say 5%. Uh, or, and when I say cut, it, even if you're just able to spend it more efficiently, um, that's, a hu that's a big, big uh, number. And um, so uh, you, know, you have to make sure that gov government is running as efficiently as possible and that you're using their tax dollars um, in the best way possible. And I would encourage the new mayor um, to have good people around him or her and um, to make sure that uh, to look at different ways of doing things and when you can save uh, even 1% uh, in New York is because your budget's so big, it's a lot of money. Um, and so uh, that's what I would encourage them to do. And the other thing is to um, really uh, do what Linda talked about, and that is look around the country. There, uh, there's a lot going on around the country that you can do here in New York. And I do agree, though. I look to New York a lot as to what New York is doing. But um, if you find a good idea, uh, implement it, uh, make it happen. And uh, I mean, you are in you know, the biggest city in the country and uh, have an opportunity to really be an example for the rest of the, uh, the, rest of the country. Great, thank you. Questions? Dale. Uh, 
sometimes no matter what, from the CEO of SCCS about things and services. I think one of the reasons why cities have become so attractive as we age through the older population, uh, we are seeing more and more that people in the city with social security and regular independence, there's a cultural stimulation, even transportation, um, and the drive, et cetera. And I'm wondering if you could comment in some way on what you see as both some of the challenges, but also some of the innovations that um, cities need to make or are doing around Um, we developed a, a based on a, a template that was um, created by um, drawing a blank of the organization very embarrassingly, but they um, essentially a city for all ages. Uh, um, um, I'm going to remember the group. Age coming up. Well, uh, the New York Academy of Medicine was a <coughs> partner here in New York City. I'll come back to it. So, the um, here in New York, we're working with the New York Academy for Medicine, we um, gathered. Uh, city partners, all the agencies, um, uh, so not just, you know, DIFTA and Human Resources Administration, but, um, but transportation and environmental protection and consumer affairs and the police department and parks and recreation. And we said, we want to look at the city from an age-friendly perspective and think about how we can integrate into everything that we're doing activities that will make the city friendlier to people who, um, who are growing older and have um, have different um, social goals, have different mobility ab um, abilities, and um, and make sure that as we are putting our money into these programs, we're actually doing them in a way that can be accessible. And we developed in a, um, a, a, a full city platform. And the thing that has been really tremendous about it is that it, it works out. It really is a city um, for all ages and all <coughs> abilities because it makes a, a higher sensitivity to all kinds of um, transportation mobility issues that the disabled community is very concerned with. It, um, it, it makes the city um, friendlier just from foot traffic and, um, and, and baby carriages and shopping carts about getting up and down and in and out and around. And so, the, for instance, the city's um, Department of Design and Construction has issued a whole new set of standards for um, private, you know, not only public, but private building construction to think about how the interiors of buildings, um, not only the streetscape, can be designed in a way that can be um, more mobility friendly. The, um, and it's an investment from city perspective. Um, a lot of times when you think about the aging population, you think about the national Medicare budget and the cost associated. But if you take a broader lens, you see that retirees have got a ton of money mm -hmm. in their pocket. And it's great for um, city economies as well. It's a place they want to be. And it brings a whole new sense of vibrancy and um, into your cities to, to, to help to create opportunities for people who are otherwise might be socially isolated to get safely out into the street and around. And in Providence, one of the things that we're doing, we're seeing is that uh, we have a lot of uh, seniors or uh, folks who are empty nesters who are coming downtown and living downtown and um, usually don't want to have a vehicle um, and like the living uh, downtown and what we're trying to do is uh, one uh, work on issues around pedestrian uh, safety and making it a more pedestrian friendly city having more walkways and um, easier to get around the city Two, we're also um, doing everything we can to work on um, green spaces and other spaces around um, to make the city more attractive and uh, better places to go uh, the other thing that we are doing is just uh, trying to recognize the, the, and, uh, the activities that, that people may want to do um, and making sure that uh, a lot of it is available because we have space downtown and we want more and more people to come uh, downtown. But we're seeing that. We've actually seen some people who have grew up in Providence, moved out of the city, <coughs> and then uh, now have come back to the city. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. It's very good for us in many ways um, because, quite frankly, they're putting a lot more into the system than they're taking out. Um, so we're, we're working to see what we can do to make it as attractive as possible and as comfortable as possible. And it's the World Health Organization is ah, the yeah. uh, <laughs> worry that's created at some point. It's a big one to forget. So. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and thank you all for your remarks. It's been very, very uh, enlightening. Uh, by your participation, it's clear that you're all involved with very successful programs and innovative programs. I was wondering if you could comment about your willingness in terms of risk taking and how you advise your teams in terms of, I won't say failure, but lack of success in terms of innovation. 
You know, the, um, the, the mayor says, um, if you don't have any failures, you're not trying hard enough. Right. And that's, I think, a great thing about his leadership is he gave permission to, um, to agencies to try. And, um, and I've fallen on my face um, flat a few times. Um, and, you know, and he's like, all right, you know, well, don't screw it up again, all right? You know, <laughs> it's like, you know keep going. <laughs> but, um, but you have to learn from your failures as much as you can learn from your successes. Um, as Commissioner of Homeless Services, you know, we started out with a bold pledge. We're going to reduce homelessness in the city by two-thirds. Today, we're higher than when the Bloomberg administration began. But over the course of those um, 11 and a half years, um, we've actually learned a number of um, policies and practices that make the system better, that help to prevent homelessness, that get people who actually um, come into sh shelter back to housing that sticks instead of seeing them again in another six months. And you know, so it's a great example of where there's a, a long way to go and the next mayor, I hope, comes in and looks at those and, and instead of just undoing everything, understands that you're 12 years ahead of where you were mm -hmm. when this administration started, but now let's figure out what our contribution is. How are we gonna take that and move forward? So there's a couple of things that, that, that we look at. One of them is, is that um, there actually is a treasure trove of what people learn through the innovation process. And so we're obsessed about rapidly helping, working with our partners to collect what they're learning in real time and sharing it in every possible way, you know, a lot of social media, uh, because what, what we find is people, you know, doing the work on the ground actually put together tidbits or nuggets of stuff. You know, you may say, oh, I, I learned about the Cities for Financial Empowerment. Something there actually helps me on my health program. You know, and it's the innovators actually take disparate ideas and that's where innovation comes from. You know, so the idea that we're gonna capture those nuggets and help those get out is actually part of the product. The other part of it is that we want to fail in multiple places at the same time, right? It's this idea of the, the, tr the innovation sitting on the periphery, you know, so it, where we're putting our energies into trying to cr find a critical mass of places that actually want to kind of innovate together, have the cross fertilization of ideas. And if they're going to fail, they're going to fail together. But more likely, if they're going to succeed, it's because they actually had this, the, the, the sharing of it. And I'll add on, on uh, risk. Um, I think you uh, have to be prepared to take risks and also understand that as mayor, no matter what you do, you're going to be criticized. Um, so I, l I have a saying in the office, so let's get criticized for doing the right thing. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, but I'll just give you one example of something that we had. We, uh, we've gone to uh, dual barrel recycling, um, or, and we basically had a big trash can that we used to use for trash. We then changed that for recycling and gave people a smaller trash barrel <laughs> for trash. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine the complaints that we've gotten on why did you change this and you know, why did, you know, why we have a small one, it's not big enough. And I keep saying, you have a lot of recyclable, put it in the recycle bin, trust me, it'll work, it'll work. And uh, in four months, we doubled our recycling rate from 15 to 30. Mm -hmm. We still have yeah. a long way to go, but it's just in four months. But we, you know, we were ready and I was prepared and believe me, I. And I, I speak Spanish as well, so they give it to me in English and Spanish. <laughs> you know, everywhere I go, and people are telling me, and you can just kind of, it, it's, it's going to work, you know. And, and uh, we're still working. There are some neighborhoods that we have an issue with. Um, either they're not using the right barrel or they're overflowing it. Uh, but we're working on it. But in a short period of time, you've seen that impact. Um, and I know that over time, we can, we can increase that even further. So um, you've got to be prepared to take risks. You've got to be prepared to take criticism. Um, but you have to believe that what you're doing is the right thing. Um, and if you make a mistake, recognize it and fix it and go on from there. Now, I, I want to apologize. I have to run, unfortunately, so I'm sorry to leave early, but I want to thank you for the opportunity to come down and talk with you. Um, I'm really uh, looking forward to learning more about the report, particularly the San Francisco uh, idea that I hope to be able to uh, use in Providence. And uh, I just encourage everyone to continue to think outside the box that we have great opportunities in, in this new digital age, especially with the information uh, that we have available to each other at uh, such a uh, low cost and no cost basis. Uh, it's really something we need to take advantage of. So um, thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, talk with you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, questions? Anybody from this side of the room? The future of public-private partnerships from the uh, urban perspective.
given some of the economic and demographic trends you've, you've described. So if we're moving towards more racially and economically diverse cities, if we're moving from uh, more of a hub and spoke economic model to a more decentralized model of more agile uh, tech startups and that kind of thing, what are the implications of those trends for the ways that cities and mayors work with the private sector? And you know, just um, for full disclosure, I, I'm gonna add to um, for David that he is um, the probably the only person in the universe who has been a high-ranking city, state, and federal um, <laughs> administrator. <laughs> the, uh, I guess cause I'm, since I'm the private public whisperer, I have to answer that, <laughs> that, that question. Um, I think uh, part of it is, uh, is that the, uh, the way I've been thinking about the, uh, a mayor's role, it's sort of more as a general contractor than as the, uh, uh, the person doing all the work. You know, and, and Detroit may be the most extreme example because they basically had a government that collapsed uh, and an economy that collapsed. But, um, but basically over the last decade in Detroit, every other sector of the economy has basically taken over the government, uh, you know, doing what the government traditionally did. But I actually think it's sort of what the future will bring. Um, so for example, you know, they never had public transit really in Detroit because as you might guess, they had a strong lobby against uh, people not using their cars. Um, and so um, the f they're, they're, they're doing their first light rail line um, down the Woodward Corridor that's actually the first leg of it's being paid for by the Kresge Foundation. You know, unprecedented. And they're not funding the whole thing, but they're basically said, we know this has to be, you know, the anchor for what happens in the future. We're putting it on the table. Everybody else, you know, it's going to be there till you come. And they sort of did that. You know, New York's a great example with the parks. You know, those really aren't run by the city of New York. Right? There, there, there's th this idea of kind of distributed leadership, a new definition of, of collaboration. The challenge is there's not necessarily the mental models, um, especially the older the generation of the, of the mayor. Because I think there's a command and control thing that, you know, boss tweet, all that kind of thing, that is sort of ingrained in the way many people view uh, cities and the role of government. And I think what you're seeing is those that can kind of let go and say, you know what, I'm going to be the general contractor. The result is this. I don't really care how we get there as long as we get there, but my job is to make sure that actually you know, the, the plumbing gets done, the electric, electrical gets, gets built. And I think you see examples of that uh, in many different cities around the country. I think just in, in my um, time in, in city government, I've also seen um, a shift in foundation funding um, move from one where the idea was to work at the local level through nonprofits mm -hmm. to develop new innovations and um, hope that it catches fire. And, um, and quite frankly, sometimes um, doing it, you know, around government, yeah. despite government, you know, in the face of government, sort of like, you know, take that, we're going to show you we can do it better. And, and moving instead to one where there's a willingness to collaborate directly with mm -hmm. government, to sort of get their hands dirty in the, in the realities of, go of government, appreciating that if you want your, um, your seed money to actually go to scale and have mm -hmm. impact, you've got to get your government partners to, um, to know you, to like you, to want the thing that you're investing in. And so I've, I've over these years, now um, moved from, in some cases, having a quite, um, um, confrontational mm -hmm. uh, relationship with some foundations that were defying public policy to now working sort of uh, in a sort of, it, it is a distributive um, leadership where in partnership yeah. and collaboration with, um, with the foundations to think about how to innovate. Yeah, I mean, just to uh, uh, amplify that a little bit, I, there's this whole movement in the U.S. that, you know, continues to build up and call it, you know, social innovation, social entrepreneurs, which is essentially not the public sector. And, and, I, and, 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 and it, it's the idea that you're going to take somebody who can you know, do a school and then do five, as opposed to actually doing municipal social innovation or municipal social entrepreneurs, where you're actually skipping over the whole uh, multi-year, multi-million dollar process of selling the idea, which the nonprofit has to do, to actually, if it works, like some of Linda's things, within two years, it's become the way the mainstream money is. Work. So that's part of the way we really look at this. It's municipal social innovation, not necessarily civic sector uh, social innovation. Other questions? No more? All right. Well, uh, well thank you all so much. This was a really uh, exciting panel, and um, I think that we all know that um, 
we are going to have a change of administration. It's, uh, and I think as, as we established in our innovation in the city report today, transitions can be a time for new ideas. And uh, we try to put 15 ideas on the table, 15 ideas that came from other cities uh, that have been models. And um, you know, I think just hearing the conversation today, uh, there's a reason why cities have become the real engines of innovation in this country. And uh, hopefully they'll get a little more of the support to not only keep, keep doing this, but have the ability to scale more of them up. So, uh, so thank you all for coming, and uh, please take a look at our report. And, and, and just uh, again, um, um, you know, the report is uh, is available on the website NYC Future. Uh, it's also uh, at City, and I want to thank again City and Bob and Eileen uh, and NYU Wagner and everybody that was that was here today. So, uh, so thank you again. Uh, have a great day.